faith. What is it? Being sure of our hope. Convinced of what we can't see. By faith, we understand the world was set in order at God's command. By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain, and for his faith, God commended him as righteous. By faith, Noah trusted God and constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. By faith, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, believing God would still fulfill his promises. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. By faith, God's chosen nation crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and praised him as it swallowed up the Egyptians. By faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped destruction because she welcomed the spies in peace. Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, David, and the prophets. By faith, they administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire. But others were imprisoned, murdered, and wandered in deserts, mountains, and openings in the earth. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So get rid of every weight, of every sin, and run. Run with endurance the race set before us. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the champion and guide of our faith. For promised joy, he endured the cross, thought nothing of its shame, and having risen again, has been handed his deserved glory at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, hello, Morning Star Church. Thank you for joining us on this weekend for our online worship experience. Today is a day known as All Saints Day across the Christian church globally, and we're going to have a commemoration for that in just a little bit. But before we get deep into our worship time today, our friend Miss Susan Rossman has something special she wants to share with us about Operation Christmas Child. But before we get to Miss Susan, we have a little a video by a young lady named Jasmine that we want to watch together. So here's the video from Operation Christmas Child. This one is for you from Jesus. Jesus loves you, my friend. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. I received these gloves that I really love. It's my favorite color. <laughs> yes. And I received this awesome mask that I'm going to scare my little sister and brother in the night with. <laughs> yes. And this pants. And I'm going to use them in every book I have for school. And these awesome socks. <laughs> And yeah, I just love it. I'm very grateful. I'm very excited. This is my favorite thing. It makes me feel like Jesus loves me. Yes. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it brings this feeling to my heart that there's somebody out there that wants to share God's word. And even though we feel lost, that God is not there, that yes, God exists and he hears our prayers. <laughs> Thank you. It is that time of year for us to bring good news and great joy to children across the world. Um, it is time again for Operation Christmas Child. Through the years, we have helped send 157 million boxes to children throughout the world. So it is time again for us to decide what we're gonna do. How can you help? Empty box, full box. The children will be packing Operation Christmas Child boxes on November 9th, and we will need help with the $9 a box in order to send them out. So please help us with this, or if you would like to pack a box, that would be a great idea as well, something for you and your family to do together to show the joy of giving. 
So if there are any questions, please feel free to call me, Susan Rossman, or text me at 205-213-7695. And we will also be putting um, that in the weekly newsletter. Um, thank you very much, and God bless. Well, thanks to Miss Susan for sharing with us about that important ministry known as Operation Christmas Child. We hope to have all those donations, the $9 per box, in by Sunday, November the 15th. So if you can help us with that, we really would appreciate that. Uh, this past Sunday, or past weekend, past Sunday evening, we had a pumpkin carving contest, and we had a pumpkin painting contest. Our students were carving, and our children were painting pumpkins, and they had a great time doing that, and I appreciate everyone taking part in that, and our children's and youth events are running uh, full steam now at 5 o'clock on Sunday evenings and building community within our young people. I want to mention, too, that a brand new series is starting for our youth this Sunday evening. Ms. Haley is going to be leading them in a series entitled Digital Self-Control. It's all about the effects that our smartphones have on us and what that means for us as followers of Jesus. So that'll be on Sunday evenings at 5 o'clock, and you can connect with all the youth ministry through the social media platforms of Instagram, Facebook, uh, and Band, and they keep you up to date on everything that's going on with that. On Sunday, November the 8th, it's the Sunday before Veterans Day on November 11th, we're going to start to receive a special offering for Healing Waters Veterans Ministry. And this is a special ministry for veterans who are dealing with the visible and the invisible scars of war. And it's a beautiful, beautiful way to do ministry along with fly fishing for these brave men and women. And if you'd like to help be a part of that, you can simply make a check out to the church and in the notation or online, uh, notate uh, Healing Waters. And that's going to be our way to support veterans. This is a regional ministry that we are a part of and we sure are blessed to be a part of it. We had a lot of fun with our worship in the woods a few weeks ago. The weather was gorgeous and in fact it was done... I guess just a great response to it. We're going to try it one more time before the winter months set in. So on Sunday, November the 15th at 10 o'clock, we're going to have one worship experience down in the woods. And I hope that you'll be able to join us for that. It's going to be a great time for our community of faith. During this Advent season that's coming up, we still have opportunities for you to sponsor families here in Chelsea. One of the things that uh, we've already been active in is helping local families. In fact, we've assisted three families this week uh, buying Christmas gifts for their children. So if you'd like to help with that, you can make that check out to the church or donate online and in pastor discretionary for Christmas. And we'll make sure those funds help families here in Chelsea. If you want to help in the greater Shelby County area, you can donate to the Oak Mountain Mission. Uh, they're going to be working with families that are in need during this holiday season. And it's one that uh, is definitely different than last year with everything that has happened within 2020. Some of you know that uh, Marshall and Lori are still in need of our prayers, and we want to continue to pray for the Mikesels. Those notes of encouragement that you've been sending through text or messenger on Facebook, uh, that's meant the world to them. And let's keep praying for the Mikesel family during this challenging journey that they're in. Now, if you're watching this on Sunday, November the 1st, you may have heard that we have an election coming up on Tuesday, November the 3rd. It seems like we've been hearing about it for almost three years now. But the day is upon us. Some people have already voted. Uh, last count I saw was around 75 million people in our country have voted already. And we have this tendency as human beings to get uh, kind of drug into some things at times where we might say something that's a little harsh about someone, even a friend, if we think that they're not voting the same way that we are on something. But as followers of Jesus, and for us coming from a Wesleyan heritage, I want to remind us about something uh, when it comes to this. Be kind. Not everyone is going to disagree with you, and not everyone's going to agree with you. And during this season, it's important for us to set the example as followers of Jesus. And as we learn about the power of words today as we enter into worship, I want to share this quote with you by John Wesley. Wesley wrote in his journal on October the 6th of 1774, I met those of our society, he's talking about the Methodist society, who had votes in the ensuing election, that was for parliament for them in England, and I advised them to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy, to speak no evil of the person they voted against, and 
to take care their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. Friends, I encourage you as servant leaders of the Morning Star Church and also followers of Jesus and citizens of the kingdom of God to do those exact same things that John Wesley talked about with the early Methodist followers there in England. I think it's a tribute to Christ when we're able to model kindness even when we disagree with other people. And I want you to keep this in mind, that the people that you agree with and that you, the people that you disagree with, every single one of them were created in the image of God. And it's important for us to remember that at all times, but especially uh, during a season like this. So friends, let's pray for God to move and work in and through these coming weeks. And let's also make a point to pray for all of our leaders on the national level, the local level, the state level, so that we can have a people that seek to do the right thing to other people and for our own families and for our own communities as well. Let's pray together. And I'm so glad today I can't think of a better way to unify us than around worshiping King Jesus. So thanks for joining us today as we continue in our series entitled Unlikely King. And as we learn what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God, let's worship together.
Today I'm reading from the New Testament book of Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse 44 through verse 46. The English translation of the Bible from which I am reading today is the New American Standard Bible translation. Matthew 13:44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from the joy over it he goes and sells everything that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold everything that he had and brought it and bought it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad that you're with us again today. Today, we're going to be talking about another parable, as you know. And just like we've talked about the last several weeks, parables are special stories that Jesus told to kind of explain to people about his love and God's love using relative terms for them in that time. Now, today, our friend Adam read the scripture for us. So I'm going to read part of it again, just so we can dive into it a little bit. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Now, that's in Matthew 13, 44. Now, Adam's going to read a little bit further when you hear his scripture. But I stopped right here so we could focus on this a little bit. I want to ask you something. When you um, are uh, really, really wanting to go outside and play and have a good time, do you ever think that you are a pirate? Pretend to be a pirate and you're going after a hidden treasure. Now, I remember when I was a little girl, I loved to do that. I loved to dig and just find special things. And my grandparents owned a lot of property, and I never knew what I was going to find. I loved playing treasure map. It was one of the most fun things I could do. Well, this kind of reminded me of that. What he's done is he, being the farmer, he had this field, and he fa- or the man, he had this field, and he found a treasure, something very, very, very important to him. So he dug it up, and he found it, but then what did he do? He hid it again. He put it back into the field. A lot of times what people would do is they would find their treasure, and then they would go and hide it in a different place. Now, how they were able to find it is they looked for the X marks the spot. So, I want to ask you something. If our treasure, like in that scripture that we're talking about, is God's love, is how we're supposed to love everybody else, where is that hidden? And, well, how can we find it? Well, X marks the spot, boys and girls. It's our Bible. Our Bible has so much knowledge about God's love and what we should and shouldn't do. And in this particular case, it's right where we can find the answers. This is our map. This is our treasure map to Jesus and to Jesus' love. So this week, I want you to not dig in your backyard or hide anything necessarily. But I want you to go and just look at yourself. Look in your heart and see what you can find. Is Jesus' love hidden in your heart? Are you sharing it with everyone around you? That's a very special treasure to have. And it's a treasure that we want to share with others. That's not one we want to keep to ourselves. So this week, see what you can do to share God's love, to share that treasure. And we'll be back next week to talk about another wonderful parable. So now what we're going to do is we're going to count to three. We're going to lead our entire congregation in the Lord's Prayer. Are you ready? One, two, three. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much, boys and girls, and I'll see you next week. Well, today in the Christian calendar marks an event known as All Saints Sunday. It's a very special day. It's a day in which we remember the saints, those followers of Jesus who have transitioned from this side of eternity into the arms of Christ in eternity. And it's something special in the life of the church because it makes sure that we remember the legacies that have been left behind 
and the lives of those that we love and that we cherish. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice about today, we, we have some lives that were longer than others and some that were shorter than others. But every single one of these lives mattered. And today when we do the liturgy together, we'll have the light of the candle and then we'll have a third candle that will be lit to symbolize someone that, that you love or someone that you know or someone that you're related to that has passed away this year. And we'll take a moment just to remember each one of these wonderful people and these major influences in our lives uh, during what is known as All Saints Sunday. Friends, let's commemorate All Saints Day together as a community of faith. Eternal God, hope of all who trust in you, you weep with those who mourn, even as you cry out in triumph over the grave. Unbind us from sin, release us from captivity, raise us from death to life, so that we may join that great crowd of saints who forever sing praise to your holy name. Through Christ, the resurrection and the life. Amen. We give thanks to God today and remember those servant leaders of the Morning Star community of faith who have transitioned from an earthly life and into the arms of Jesus. Today we remember baby Luca Johnson. Today, we remember David White. And we also remember the friends and the loved ones of your friends and loved ones, your family members today that may not have been a member of the Morning Star United Methodist Church, but are very special to you and to countless others. Let's remember them today and give a prayer of gratitude and thanks to God for them. Faithful God, source of every blessing, teach us to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who persecute us, to turn the other cheek, to share our resources, to give to those who are in need, and to do to others as we would have them do to us, so that we may join that company of blessed saints who feast with you in heaven. You have knit together your servant leaders in one communion and fellowship, in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Grant us grace so to follow your holy saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those unspeakable joys which you have prepared for those who sincerely love you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Nothing will change If all the plans I make go wrong Your love stays the same Your light will guide me through it all I'm hanging on I'm leaning in to you
Friends, thank you for joining us today for the third part of our Unlikely King series. Uh, Today, we're going to be learning what it means to have a treasure in our lives. Now, for a family, it's hard for everyone in the family to make a decision about seeing a a movie or going to a movie theater. Well, I'm a history buff. Shelly likes the funny, romantic stuff. The boys like anything with superheroes. So anytime that we can find something that all of us can agree on with a little bit of adventure, a little bit of romance, a little bit of history. It's a pretty big deal at the Puckett House. And there is a particular set of movies that kind of covers all those things with us, and it's a movie entitled National Treasure. And in the movie, if, you've, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to blow the plot, but it's got the actor Nicolas Cage in it, and he is trying to protect the uh, Constitution of the United States. And, of course, there's a romantic interest in the movie, and they're combating over this and trying to keep the Constitution from the bad guys. And toward the end of the film, there's this climactic scene in which they are dangling on this old wooden scaffold, and he is holding the Constitution in one hand and holding the hand of his love interest in the other. And he says, do you trust me? And she had to make a decision if she trusted him or not, and she said yes. And if you watch the movie, you'll see that it it worked out okay, but it doesn't always work out that way. It does in the movies, but not necessarily in real life. History is filled with tales of people who went on a search for treasure. In fact, you could probably say they were chasing after treasure. And oftentimes, it doesn't end in the way that the film ended, with everything working out and the good guys saving the day. But throughout history, people have chased treasure after treasure after treasure, and they have lost their spouses, they've lost their families, they've lost their homes, they've lost their jobs, they've lost their very lives in the very pursuit of treasure. You may even know someone that shares that story of trying to go after treasure in this life and missing out on all the other things in life. In each one of those situations of loss, In each story of tragedy, the person looking for the treasure or chasing after the treasure was consumed with a desire for something that in the end really just did not hold any eternal significance. The person was chasing after the wind. They were building a house of cards. They were wasting their life. And the question that Nicolas Cage's character asked in this film, do you trust me? is especially relevant to the parable that Jesus shared in Matthew 13 that our friend Adam read for us just a little while ago. It is a question that Jesus continually asks of us throughout our lives. Do you trust him with your life? Do you trust that Jesus is who he says he is? Do you trust that Jesus is Lord? Do you trust that Jesus can save all of humankind? And do you trust what Jesus said about the kingdom of God? And that's what we've been talking about in this series entitled Unlikely King. And the question today for all of us is, do I trust Jesus with my life? Do I trust Jesus with my life? Because the kingdom of God is God's active and dynamic reign over God's creation. The kingdom of God is God's active and dynamic reign over God's creation. 
Now, we could actually substitute that term, the kingdom of God, for the reign of God, and that may be a more accurate representation of what Jesus said from the original Hebrew text. This is important because it means that the kingdom of God doesn't really have any physical boundaries like a kingdom that we would think of throughout history or even a government today where there's borders. Technically, the reign of God or the kingdom of God, it's the entire world. It's all of his creation. Yet we know from our lives that there are places where we may find ourselves at some point in life, our company that we may spend time with in this life, who do not seem to be a part of God's reign. And that is because the reign of God is demonstrated in the way in which we live our lives. The reign of God is demonstrated in the way in which we live our lives. And the kingdom of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, is meant to be a place of, of our primary allegiance. The kingdom of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, is meant to be the place of our primary allegiance. Now, today's text of Matthew 13 features stories that share four basic things in every one of the themes. You have the discovery of something that's valuable, you have joy, you have death, and then you have life. And in the story that Jesus shares, or the parable, once the object that represents the kingdom is found in both of these stories in particular today, the finder immediately does something about it. And the stories that Jesus share here highlight the joy of finding the treasure, not the loss of their former selves or anything they had to give up to get the treasure. In the first story, uh, the item of value that Jesus talks about is actually a treasure. He shares a story of a farmer who has been hired to plow a field. The farmer doesn't own the field, and in that act of plowing, a treasure is brought to the surface. The person realizes, oh my goodness, this is a treasure. So he goes and sells everything that he has so that he can purchase the field. Now in the second part of today's scripture that Adam read for us, you have a merchant who is in the market of buying and selling pearls. One day he finds the mother load, the pearl of great value, and he sells everything else that he has to buy this one particular pearl. In one case, the act of discovery is intentional, and in the other, it is unintentional. But in both cases, Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of God is like a treasure that we can discover. And once we have the treasure, though, what are we going to do about it? That's one of the questions that he posed to everyone that was listening to his teaching that day. Once the kingdom of God is discovered and we experience the joy of finding it, there is a response. And that response is the spiritual death of ourselves. And so our key question today is, what do you treasure most? And here is our big challenge with that. We get in the way. The issue is not that we do not love Jesus enough. I have people that say that all the time to me. The issue is that we really do not know how much he loves us. Some folks think that their problem is just simply that they do not love Jesus enough, but that's not the issue at all. The issue is that we really do not know how much he loves us because if we did understand this, we could not be able to, but to help but love Jesus. 1 John 4, 1, 9 says, we love because he first loved us. Now, Scripture tells us, and you've probably heard this before, or maybe you've even seen it on a bumper sticker. It tells us that God is love. God doesn't just have love. God is love. And the only reason that there is love in this universe is because of God. And the reason that humankind has the ability to give love and to receive love is that we are made in the image of God. Because the rest of creation, even though God called it good, it is not created in God's image. And as a human being, we can receive God's love and then love God back. In fact, our number one job is to let God love us. That's it. God is love. God loves us on the good days. God loves us on the bad days. God loves us when we feel it. And God loves us when we do not feel it. God's love is not based on who we are, but it is based on who God is. And God's love is not based on what we do, but on what God has already done for us. That's what God's love is all about.
And if we want the blessing or the power and the anointing of God in our lives, we must build our lives on three godly qualities. Integrity, humility, and generosity. Integrity, humility, and generosity. These are what I call the antidotes to the three great traps of temptation in life. Now, the only good thing that we could probably say about Satan is that Satan is completely predictable. I mean, he really is. Satan doesn't have any new temptations to try to trip us up in this life. Satan's used the exact same three temptations on everyone from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, Samson, David, Solomon, even Jesus. And they're the same one Satan uses on us as well. These three temptations are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now John, one of the original followers of Jesus from Galilee, said in 1 John chapter 2, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that it is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Now, John is the very same guy that in John 3, 16, a verse that most of us know, especially if you're from the church belt, he says something that's a little different. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Well, that kind of sounds like a a contradiction because in 1 John, he's telling us to not love the world or the things of it. And then in John three sixteen it says, for God so loved the world. But to really make sense of it, we've got to understand the meaning of this word world that John uses there. In John three sixteen, God is talking about the people of the world. God has never made a person that God does not love. And God has never made a person without a purpose. And one of those primary purposes is to let God love you and then to make a choice to love God back. And in 1 John, John is actually talking about the value system of this world that we're not supposed to love. We're to love the people and to hate the values system. It's what he's talking about there. And our challenge, especially in modern North America, the 21st century, we tend to do the exact opposite. We hate the people and love the value system. In the North American church, we can be just as materialistic, just as sensual, just as prideful, just as arrogant, and just as self-centered as the rest of the world. And if we build integrity and humility and generosity into our lives, then we're going to reflect a citizenship within the kingdom of God right here on earth. That is why Jesus kept saying, do you want to know how to bring heaven here? Let me tell you about this kingdom. What is lust of the flesh? Now, most people think of sex when they think about this, and it dominates a lot of things in our society. But it's actually not just that. It is the temptation to feel pleasure, our passions. That can be food. For me, seeing that hot now sign on at the Krispy Kreme is, is something I just I fight hard to resist. It could be alcohol for some. It could be drugs. It could be social media. Investing too much time binge watching TV. It could be pornography. If you were to take a philosophy class, they would say that this is hedonism. To please the flesh and to feel pleasure. The lust of the eyes. What is that? It's the temptation to have. I see it, so I want it. Actually, that sin right now is something that's permeating just about every part of our community right now because the Christmas wish books have just shown up in all the mailboxes. And from the little kids all the way up to the grown-ups are looking through the wish book saying, I see it and I want it. That's actually called materialism. It's based on possessions. And then the pride of life that we're talking about is a temptation to be. We just don't want to be just loved. We want to be admired. Then we want to be envied because we are perceived that we are better than everyone else. And that goes all the way back to Eve in the Garden of Eden when she saw the fruit of the tree and she liked the looks of it. That's called in philosophy class secularism. We become the center of the universe, the kingdom of me, positions of popularity, of power, of prestige. 
And if we are the centers of our own universe, friends, that we need a much better reason to get up and going in the morning if we're the center of it all. And one of those three things, sometimes all three, I just mentioned is a foundational block of every marketing campaign ever. Buy our product and you'll feel great. Get our product and you'll be smarter and wealthier for having it. And if you buy our product, you'll be envied by others. Sex, salary, status. And all these things, when they rule us, friends, they lead us far away from the kingdom of God. The kingdoms that we build, they're so minuscule. And in the end, they don't really matter. Now, Satan never says, do this and you'll be just like me. Now, he's not that dumb. He says, do this and you'll be the center of your own universe. You can be your own God. Most folks want to be his or her own center of the universe. One historical figure uh, who was one of our presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, his, his daughter used to say about his big ego and his charisma, he said, uh, she said, my dad wants to be the baby at every christening, the bride at every wedding, and the corpse at every funeral. That he wanted to be the center of all attention. I think all of us deal with that. Now there's a new age movement, which is ironic that it's called new age because the movement is built around placing ourselves around the center. And the irony in it being called New Age is actually the oldest light. It dates all the way back to the garden. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he was hungry. And you may know the story of where Satan came to him and said, take these stones and turn them into bread because you're hungry. By Jesus mulling this, he reminded us that temptation always builds on our needs. It always builds on our wants and it always builds on our passions. And the temptation is when we seek to use our gifts, our abilities, to satisfy our own flesh. It's one of the first temptations of life that we encounter when we are pursuing our identity or seeking to be a citizen within the kingdom of God. Satan wants us to be successful as long as we'll take the credit and give no glory to God. Whether it's in the academic field, the musical field, the athletic field, you name it. If you claim the glory for it, he wants you to have it. Friends, our gifts and our abilities, our strengths, they are given to us for us to use them in building the kingdom, not to advance our own identities or our own reputations. Often that is easily seen in life because we use our gifts, we use our abilities to feed our needs and to also feed our families and to take care of them. Then Satan took Jesus on a second temptation. He went to show him the treasures of the world. He said, everything you see, Jesus, I'll give to you if you choose to worship me. Friends, this is the lust of the eyes that we were just talking about. And when we sell out what God has for our lives simply for money or prestige, and to sell out what God has created you to do in order to profit. Then the third temptation came up. We've talked about the, the first two already, but the third one, Satan takes Jesus to the temple mount there in Jerusalem and tells him to prove that he is God in the flesh by throwing himself off the precipice or the corner of the temple mount. Well, what is wrong with Jesus being worshipped as God? Satan says, if you'll throw yourself off from here, people will worship you because you will not die. What's wrong with that? Well, really nothing, but the way to worship Jesus is through what he did for us on the cross in an effort of unconditional love, not through showing off for others. And he said, he told Satan, he says, I'm not supposed to tempt my father. What will it benefit us if we show off in a way to bring attention to ourselves? Jesus is trying to model how to withstand these three temptations that every single one of us have cast at our lives. Friends, none of those three things that Satan tries to get us to buy into, none of that is what the kingdom is about. Integrity means what you see is what you get. Look at how often we hide behind our own mask in this life. Jesus actually called it uh, being a hypocrite or Hippocrates, which is where, or hypocritos in the Greek, uh, where you had actors that would hide behind a mask and you would have one actor who could play eight to 10 roles uh, by hiding behind different masks on the screen. Every generation thinks that they <laughs> thought up this idea of authenticity, but it's not really true. No generation likes phonies. Every generation really wants to be real. 
And the first step toward authenticity in life is for us to admit our inauthentic attempt to be authentic. The first step toward authenticity in life is for us to admit our inauthentic attempt to be authentic. Look, if we're thinking hard or strategically thinking about it, uh, we're not authentic. If we're showing off for something, we're not in it for the kingdom. We're glorifying ourselves. And that's not authentic. That's not being the real, being real. And the very moment, friends, that we start to segment our life, whether it's involving sex or our, our home life, our faith life, our work life, our school life, our neighborhood life, the moment we start to do that, we've lost our integrity. Many of you have probably heard the story about the Titanic. Now, years ago when the film came out, I actually went to and, and sat through that entire movie. And on the way out, I heard a young girl, a teenage girl, ask one of her friends, did you know the boat was going to sink? Uh, <laughs> some of you may know that story. But the Titanic was considered by its builders to be the ship that not even God could sink. Well, the Titanic was considered unsinkable because it was the very first ship to use this process of compartmentalizing the hull of the vessel. And up until this time, ships had one large hull. And the theory was that if there was an iceberg strike to the hull, they could shut it off in one compartment and prevent the ship from taking on water or sinking. But friends, a hole in the boat is a hole in the boat. And water is going to find a place to go. And the Titanic still went down. Now, if we're out fishing and I start to put a hole in the end of my boat, I'm going to take you down with me. And some folks, friends, they fall for these temptations and sin and think that they're not hurting anyone else. But make no mistake about it. Sin may be private, but it is never personal. Sin may be private, but it is never personal. Friends, there's a major connection between our identity and sin. And if we're at peace with ourselves because we're fighting our identity in God and how much God loves us with everything that God has, we will not be susceptible to finding our worth in pleasure, in things, or other people's attention. Because our number one job in life is to let God love us and to choose to love God back. And if we get that, everything else will fall into place. And that takes us right back to where we started today. What do you treasure the most? What do you treasure the most? You know, when we stop and examine our lives, what holds the most beauty? Too often, instead of seeing the beauty and the value of the treasure that is the kingdom that Jesus talked about, we leave it buried in the field. We keep on walking or we keep on shopping for more and more stuff or we keep on looking for something better. Our agendas, they remain our agendas. And if they happen to overlap with God, great. But if not, when all is said and done, our agenda is going to be the one that rules the day. That's human nature. And this pearl of great value that Jesus talked about being the kingdom just sits there, unappreciated, unused, and undervalued. And when we do that, simply put, we waste our lives. What is of incomparable value to you today? Our purpose in this series is not just to learn about the kingdom, but to learn about the king of all kings. And King Jesus wants his agenda for your life to be first in your life. King Jesus wants his agenda for your life to be first in your life. And the king is offering us something far better than anything else in this life. How often do we look continually for greener fields, so to speak, not realizing that in the field that we have been in sets a great and priceless treasure? How often do we spend our time window shopping only to miss that the king has placed what we see right where we can find it, right in front of us? Why does Jesus do that? Well, friends, Jesus loves you and he values you. And Jesus knows that he can work in and through you to build his kingdom and to give you something that is far better than anything else you can have in this life. Because remember, the issue is not that we do not love Jesus enough. The issue is that we really don't know how much Jesus loves us. And if we understand this, we'll not be able to help but love Jesus. Because the kingdom of God, it's meant to be an active reign over God's creation. And how we spend all of our time reveals a treasure 
of our lives. And the question will always, always be, do you trust Jesus? questions for reflection today. What do you treasure most? What do you treasure most? 
what is of incomparable value to you? What is of incomparable value to you? Which one of the three temptations Satan uses is the most challenging for you? Which one of the three temptations Satan uses is the most challenging for you? Have you considered what life should look like when you are living in a kingdom with King Jesus actively reigning? Have you considered what life should look like when you are living in a kingdom with King Jesus actively reigning? What transformation or changes might need to be made today? What transformation or changes might need to be made today? Do you realize how much Jesus loves you? Do you realize how much Jesus loves you? God bless you with discomfort. Discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears. Tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with foolishness. Enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world. Others claim cannot be done. Thank you so much for joining us for our online worship experience this weekend. I look forward to worshiping with you again next week. Blessings on you, and I'll see you soon.